We're at Laverstoke Park Farm today in Hampshire, where the F1 world champion from 1979, Jody Schechter, lives. And not only does he have a very successful organic farm, but he also has an amazing collection of F1 cars. Come on inside and meet Jody. Hello, Jody. Hi. How are you? Looking at all your lovely cars. What an incredible collection you have. Yeah, why don't we come there and we start from the beginning if you'd Definitely. like. So the, the first one there is a, the Magic Merlin. Emerson Fittipaldi had it. And then he sold it to a guy called Colin Vanderbilt and he won nearly all the races. I bought that second hand. Lovely. And uh, didn't have any tools or anything. said deliver it to Brands Hatch. Took a taxi out there and I was on the second row or something and then spun and came through the field to second. And they had a, Grand Prix, they had a, a Formula One race at the same time, which was quite good for that. Then I borrowed this car, it was a Formula 3 chassis. Firestone lent me a set of tyres from South Africa. I borrowed an engine and I got some lap records and crashed and won some races. <laughs> and McLaren then offered me a Formula, that was my first year, McLaren offered me a Formula 3 year contract at the end of that. And that was Formula 2. It's looking uh, pretty scary compared to some of the F1 cars we're looking at today. Yeah, but this is Formula 2, so this okay. would be the, 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 the Formula, because it, in those days it was Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. Formula th one drivers quite often raced in Formula Two, and I won Crystal Palace with this. And it was the first time I felt well, okay, maybe I'm ready to go to the next step, if you want. When you look back to coming over to the UK for the first time, was it daunting? And how daunting was it to come over and establish yourself in the F1 market? Well, I mean, I was doing Formula Ford at that stage, and I'd won that driver to Europe for come over here for for three months. I'd never been out of South Africa before, so I packed my suitcase with spare soap on and everything, like I was self-sufficient for a while. I, I never found it daunting. I just, um, I, I just found it. Uh, just had to find my way, really. And people's reactions uh, to the first couple of years of your career maybe weren't quite what you were expecting. Did their comments sort of ever get to you? No, no, no. no. Well, it's too, too far. Away. My style of driving was very sliding and everything like this. So actually, I got noticed very quickly. Not that it was always positive uh, from a driving point of view. And that got me up to Formula One in the second year uh, over here. Uh, you're talking about a few little crashes I had. Um, yeah, didn't, didn't bother me at all. The big accident everybody knows about was the one at Silverstone, which uh, the first time I saw it was on YouTube a couple of years ago, which was, um, and that was, I mean, I'm lucky to get out of it. Quite a lot of the accidents I had, I was very lucky to get out of. Thank goodness when I came there, they'd just done enough modifications to stop the fires, mostly. I think Nicky was the only one that caught fire once I went to Formula One. But before that, they were burning. Um, when I went to Brands that time, you just saw smoke at the back there and all the cars had stopped and somebody had basically been burnt in the car. And, and you, were, you and, in that car. and you were you were in three the overalls. You had three sets of underwear and and thick uh, overalls because you wanted to last another twenty or thirty seconds if there was a fire. Obviously, a lot of people say that the turning point in your career, from their point of view, was with Francois Sauvert. Would you agree with them? No, no. What, what that was, I was on the first one on the scene at that time, and um, it, it's the first time I, was, I suppose you you knew people were getting killed and things. But the first time maybe it got home to me. Um, I don't know if it changed the way I drove at all, but it really made me realise that, you know, it's very dangerous and you can get killed. And you were very young, starting in F1. Do you think that perhaps you could have had more time before you got into F1, or, or actually no. F1 helped you? I had, I, I raced in South Africa and um, then I raced Formula Ford, Formula 3 over here and Formula 2. I mean, I was 21, 22. But, but if you compare to how many races I raced in compared to the drivers today, uh, it was much less. You just, you do, what you, you do what you're doing, you know, you want to just do your best and you, you want to prove to yourself, I never thought of coming over here and doing Formula One. I want to just win what I was doing and I won in Formula Ford, crashed more than I won actually. And then Formula Three, I did quite well in the Formula Two and then I won at Crystal Palace. So then I felt, well, maybe I'm good enough to go to the next step and then uh, Lotus offered me a drive at the end of my second year here. And then I went to McLaren's and said, they've offered me a drive and they said, OK, I'll supply you with a car, which is actually this one. And, um, and then I did that in Watkins Glen, was my first Formula One race. I took Jackie Stewart's place in Tyrrell. 
And, and um, I was supposed to be uh, with Sebat, and that, that was the race in Watkins Glen where I came around first and just saw the nose of the Tyrrell in the middle there and jumped out because it was always a fire. And I remember the, 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 bra the battery was sparking and I grabbed to his safety belt and I just turned around. I don't remember what I saw, but I knew it was completely nothing. And thank goodness I don't remember it. And walked away and the drivers were stopping and I said, oh, it's useless, it's coming on. So this was the first year and then we did third in the championship here. The next year, nowhere. And then the, the third year was with the six-wheeler. It was really fun to drive, although I didn't agree with the, the theory behind it. With the wheels, you'd brake much better, but that was correct unless you started going into a corner, then one of the little wheels jumped up and locked, so you had to back it off. But when looking back, I did better than I thought I did. We won in Sweden with this, and again, we were third in the championship with this. In the first year with Tyrrell, we left Monza equally leading the world championship. Um, and then in Canada, my brakes broke and I hit the wall. And then I didn't do, I didn't do that badly, but I didn't do that well at, when I came third in the championship. So at that stage, you felt, well, I couldn't win the championship. It took me another, what, seven years or six years to, to, to be able to actually do it, to get everything in place. Actually, Frank Williams was racing, uh, was running this team. They hadn't qualified in half the races before, and I joined them. And that was quite a big gamble going to them then. Yes, and, and it could remind me a bit of, of um, Lewis going to, to Watson and going to, to Mercedes. But we had 20 people in the team. I got Frank fired, Peter Waugh from Lotus came in because he had won championships and stuff like that. And then I got hold of Ferrari, sent him a, a, a telex in those days. And uh, we were the first car other than a Ferrari to go and practice on the, on the track. This, this, was a gr no, this year was really fun because were, Ferrari had 200 people, we had 20. And we were beating them. 79 was the Ferrari. I'd been talking to them for a lot. They came to me at the beginning of the year before. And I said, I don't want to talk about it now. I want to do the season and everything. And they said, no, no, we want to do something. So I signed the contract after about the th fourth race and of course kept it quiet until the end of the year and then, and then joined, joined them. What was happening at that stage was Lotus had come out with a wing car. In other words, the air goes underneath, it looks like a wing and it, and it pulls it down the ground. And the speeds went up massively from one year to the next. The problem with this car, it had a 12 cylinder which was very wide, so you didn't have much air to go under. But we also had Michelin tires, which I think was a big part of us winning the championship. It was the first radials although they collapsed at a few races. Probably an obvious question, your favourite race, favourite moment in this car? Uh, well, winning Monaco is always, always special. Um, winning the Grand, winning Monza and winning the World Championship was great, although that was the, the team manager, did the worst joke I've ever heard. He came and he said, because we had won a relief after seven years or you've won the championship, he said your wing was illegal, they're taking the points away. And, but that wasn't a great joke, I can tell you. <laughs> Once you do it, you realise how special it is driving for Ferrari, you know, and how special it is. You're driving for Italy, that's the big difference, where other teams you're driving for the team. When, you, when I went into a restaurant and there were probably 100 people in the restaurant, they, they all stood up and clapped when I walked in. The, ne the year after I retired, I couldn't get a booking though. <laughs> but you left F1 quite abruptly after winning your championship. Yeah. Had you always planned to win and go, or is that something that changed? No, you know, I, I think the, a lot of the magic got out of um, racing when I saw what the things were happening. One to dri two drivers were killed every year. A lot of people in the, in the sport didn't seem to care very much about that. I fought for safety a lot, especially in my last uh, couple of years, really. And I had won the championship. I really didn't mean much to win it twice. And so I thought, let's, let's get out and try and do something else. It's an incredibly dangerous era. We've seen the Rush film. It portrays a very sort of glamorous, high-paced, playboy-type era. Was it like that? No, no, not at all. I mean, the European races, you arrived there Thursday, you practiced Friday, Saturday, and you raced Sunday, and you just wanted to get home. So. Now, the French drivers were slightly different. They probably had a, 
uh, more fun than I did. But I always felt, you know, I've got so many mechanics working on my car, and if I'm messing around, then it just wasn't right. Um, uh, so so I, I probably did less of it than most drivers. James Hunt, obviously not French, but still enjoyed the, the life of, of F1. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, I mean, I stayed with him down in Spain. I was not with him. We were about a kilometre apart. So I was quite friendly with James. Um, yeah, but, you know, his career was very short when he was good. And I think it was because of all his other activities, yeah. If you were to compare the 1970s with 2013, do you see it's it's got better, it's improved as a sport, or do you think it's lost a bit of its flair and the passion? It's sort of, it's, it's got it's both ways. I mean, the technology is fantastic now, and, and, uh, and the safety is obviously miles, miles better than, than it was. And, and in a way, it's the same. They still have oversteer and understeer and, and no traction, so that's what w we used to have. The, the thing that I think is really lousy now is the, the tyres, because you can't push the car at all, so you really, you're driving under which, it's the limit of the tyres, you don't want to slide them because you just kill them. Who on the current Formula One grid would you say reminds you most of yourself when you were racing? Um, <laughs> I used to say uh, Lewis, but I crashed and he didn't in the first few years. Um, but I, no, I don't, I, don't re I don't really know. I suppose I was very wild when I first got in and then I just became more, I suppose, less wild because I wanted to win a championship and in the beginning you want to just prove that you're fast enough. Um, so, but not, not really anybody. Um, and I suppose following on from that, who would be your favourite current driver that you look at and you think, wow, he's got it? I mean, there's no question. Lewis is one of them. Um, um, Vettel, there's no, yeah, absolutely. Um, Alonso is, uh, what's say, not that I like what he has done. No. And you mentioned the rules and regulations. If you had a one-on-one -on -one with Bernie Eccleston for a moment, what would you ask him to change about the sport? Uh, what I think, one of the sad things is, is in our day and earlier, you had different engines and you had different engine sounds. And that was really, because that car, the Ferrari, sounds wonderful and the, the, the V8 Fords were another sound. Today, everyone sounds the same, and that's taken quite an, and now it's so much more restricted, you don't see a lot of different designs coming in. It's, it's a little tweak there, or a little tweak there, and that's, that's quite uh, taken away, certainly some of, the, some of it, um, but it's probably more competitive now to a lower level. And who was your favorite driver to race against when you were competing? Who was the worst one? Let me think. Of somebody I can't remember their name. So that was completely useless. I would enjoy riding against them. No, um, no. You, you, some drivers you could trust. You know, Nicky Lauda. You could trust at any time. You could go next to him. He wasn't going to do anything stupid. Most of the French drivers at that time, Jerry A was just. You never knew what he was going to do. He was. He was. Uh, you know. So you, you just had to look at it from that point of view. Um, yeah, you raced. It, it, it's, I always look, you, you win and lose races yourself. So it's not really worrying about somebody else. You've got to worry about yourself and, and how you can set your car up and how you can do the best you can do, rather than worrying about who else you're racing against, in a way. You finished F1, that's behind you. It's sort of, do you class it as a closed book? That's something that happened a long time ago now. Yeah, I can hardly remember it anymore. Um, yeah, you know, and, and it, it's in a way it's helping me in my business here now more than any time because when I won the World Championship, I, I always thought it only lasted a week because I, the old man wanted me to go to Imola a week afterwards and I said, no, I've been trying to do this for uh, seven years. How many Grand Prix I've been down? Just, I just want to, no, no, you had to go. And I, and I was beaten there. I think Jill was faster than me, so my, my championship worked. Uh, well. But now the, the people that were watching me and playing with the, the little cars that were my cars are now in prominent positions. So when I'm doing stuff, it's, it helps me now. And you've got this incredible farm set up. How much of your F1 attitudes and your mindset do you, do you use it in the, the farm? Well, well you know, I had a business in America that was very successful. That's how I can afford to, to do this. 
and that was moving, Formula One is moving technology at the fastest pace of any industry, and even at wartime. And so you learn to do that, and you learn you know, in an hour you've got maybe eight different things you could try. In industry, that would take eight months. And so that helped me a lot. And then uh, in, the, in the business in America, you were training for an event that was r racing. And there I was training, making a simulator to train police and military for an event. So that, that helped me a lot. Here, the development helps me, developing ice cream, developing anything. The fundamentals are very important. Um, there's some things you've got to be very strict on and some things you can move fast on. And I think I, what I've learned is to develop things very fast. Um, and that's helped me a lot. But, you know, also, you don't want to lose, you know. And, and, and Formula One, when the, when the flag goes down, if you're not there, you finish. You, in industry, I'll give me another few more weeks or something. So you learn to, to work to deadlines. I always say to people, if you're 1% down in Formula One, you're at the back of the grid. In industry, if you're 25% down in some industries, you're still one of the best companies. So I've looked at all my, the, the business in America and here, and looked at every element from the soil to the grass to animals, and I've researched every, every area. We've even got a, a, a lab that's got a doctor in microbiology and chemistry studying the soil. So I've looked at it, I think the same as I looked at Formula One, which has never really been done before. And I suppose the question everyone's gonna be asking when they watch this, you know, why farming for an F1 driver? Well, well, what happened is I, the, I was successful in the business in America, came back here, bought 530 acres, was completely out of it, and I just, as a hobby, said, I'm going to produce the best tasting, healthiest food for myself and my family. And then it just grew and grew and grew until it, now it's, I've got 160 people, we've got seven factories on the farm uh, doing too many different things. Yeah. I started eight companies at once, which was completely stupid. So how many buffalo have you got here? We've got about 250 here, but I have about two and a half thousand buffalo. I have on uh, two others milking for us, and uh, seven other farms with our buffalo on. And they're all queuing up to come in and yeah, be milked. Yeah, yeah. How many milking sessions do you have a day? Two. Same as a Morning cow. Enough, same yeah. as a cow. They produce about half the amount as a cow, and um, it's uh, it, it's got twice as much of everything. And that's that's on the ice cream and mozzarella. You, you Italians wouldn't eat a cow's mozzarella. That's just like rubber. So buffalo, buffalo milk is much superior milk. So then they go back out into the fields and they are they fed out the, there? Yeah, or? Gr grass. Ex no extra feed? No, nearly no extra food, yeah. yeah. And it's your special grass that you've... Yeah, we've got 31 herbs, clothes and grasses in it. Yeah, yeah. they're very strong but very placid. If you go in the field, they'll come up to you. Really? And no. they're not shy and they won't fright? No, no, much, much more than a cow. And right. you, have, you have babies as well, baby ones? Yeah, no, the baby's quite interesting because when you don't treat them right at the beginning, they stop eating and you can't, they just die. And so we've changed the methods like this so we're getting a lot less of that. Um, and you eat, eat the buffalo as well, it's yes, not just the yes. milk? The, the fillet of a buffalo is better than a cow. The rest of it, it's not a meat animal, so the, the, other, the other cuts are quite often quite tough. Right. So more for like a stew, perhaps, or a yeah, or, or bultong, or sausage, or something. Bultong. Like oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Bringing the South African into Hampshire. It's an amazing setup. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. I'm thinking it's all making that yummy ice cream and the, the delicious the mozzarella. mozzarella. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So good. Yeah. The it's got a good perfect. smell in here as well. Yeah. Oh. You're gonna have oh my gosh. The oil. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah. So what's the, what's, the way, what's the best way? Well, bit of tomato, a bit of... Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what makes this mozzarella so special? Well, the thing is, in, in Italy, you, the Italians would eat it first day. It's slightly different to this, but most... Uh, most okay. um, and it's slightly, it's slightly more firm, but it's got yeah. a, a tasting because most mozzarella, or most English people, think it's nice when it's soft and everything. Well, that's actually going, not going off, but it's getting, it's, it's not right. Time. Yeah, exactly. That is delicious. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. have it for breakfast, lunch and supper? No, I, I used to when I started, actually, so. Oh, my God. Mm. Yum. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Delicious. I started, really, to just produce the best tasting, healthiest food. 
And then I went around lectures and around the world and read, I've got about 500 books, a lot of them from the beginning of the last century. So I studied soil and then grasses and everything. And we've won, um, we've won a lot of different uh, awards. We won the best organic produce with our Sainsbury's Telegraph Award. And then we won best overall food with our lamb. And the mozzarella being one of your key products. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the ice cream is probably bite. the ice cream is probably our most superior product. But you know, we won it for our lamb, we won it for our beer, um, ice cream a lot. Uh, that is so good. Yeah. And, uh, wow. So, so this is this is a sort of tasting that we do, and and you're okay. gonna ma you're gonna make a noise after say, mmm, mmm, <laughs> yum, that is so delicious. Mmm, oh my god, whoever said vanilla was plain. Oh my gosh. That is mm. licorice. Yum. Which is your favourite? Probably um, oh, honeycomb. So yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I can see coach. Yeah. What is this? Honeycomb. <gasps> that is our latest one. It's that is really good. Yeah, no, no. That is a good That's one. That's probably my favourite now. So how much ice cream are you making in a week, would you say? Depends. Um, it's very. That's a very difficult market because you've got Ben and Jerry's and, and Hagen Dust, mm. and they, they're about a pound cheaper. And then when you go in there, they go two for one. So it's it's a it's a wow. very difficult market. But it's probably our most superior product. Oh, so yeah. good. Yum. Thank you. Right. <laughs> thank you good so much. Really pleasure. lovely you, to meet you. An absolute you need to pleasure. get the, your what's name, don't you? Oh yes, that'd be perfect. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be. Uh, Filming you the whole day long. Learn some of my secrets, which you've been disgraced from. <laughs>